Welcome to the Global Gaming Business Podcast, the industry's first and longest running podcast now in our 17th year. I'm Roger Gross, the publisher of GDB, and this week we sit down with Brooks Pierce, the president and COO of Inspired Entertainment, on how his company has grown over the past year and why it is one of the most dynamic organizations in the industry. This program is sponsored by Konami Gaming. Later in the show, we're talking about a Konami creation that keeps reaching more and more properties year after year, so stay tuned. Welcome to the Global Gaming Business Podcast. Our guest today is uh, is Brooks Pierce from Inspired Gaming. Brooks, thanks for joining us. It's always good to catch up with you here at G2E. Yeah, thank you, Roger. Likewise. And it's uh, nice to get back together with the industry, even though it's it's still a little bit strange with the masks and the social distancing and everything. But uh, but uh, you know, it's nice to see everybody. Yeah, no, I think it's it's been nice to have some face to face meetings. It's been a while since we've done that. Right. And, uh, I do find it a little strange as you're walking down the hallway and people you think you would know, you <laughs> yeah, don't right, know exactly with their right. mask, and then they <laughs> pull it off and you are you feel embarrassed that you're like, oh, jeez, I should have known who that was. <laughs> right, but no, anyways. Sure. I, I've, I've walked down the hall a couple of times and I'm like, <laughs> This, is that who I think exactly. it is? You know? Exactly. <laughs> you know, you don't want to stop them. And, no, oh, no, no exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so let's talk about what happened uh, during the pandemic to with Inspired. Uh, you know, it obviously Im- impacted every company in the world, sure. basically. Uh, sure. uh, what was it? What was the impact with Inspired? Well, it was pretty dramatic. Mm-hmm. Um, of roughly thirteen hundred plus employees, at one point we had eleven hundred furloughed. Yeah. Um, the UK government was actually very uh, generous and, and allowed us to, uh, to, to do that and mm-hmm. have the people be kind of setting it aside. But every bit of our retail business was completely shut sure. down. We didn't right. have one operation going. Mm-hmm. Um, but the good news is our online gaming businesses, both the iGaming side and the virtual sports side, you know, took off like a, like a rocket. Right. And fortunately, we're in the position now that everything has come back from a retail perspective mm-hmm. and everything's back up and running. And, and actually, the numbers are kind of come back to where they had pre-COVID. Right. But we had assumed that the, um, the online gaming would soften up at that right. point, but it, but it really hasn't. Yeah. Um, I think it does validate this strategy that a lot of people are talking about out sure. here, yeah. is that online gaming and retail gaming can coexist right. and, and maybe even thrive. Right. Well, we've seen that, you know, in in New Jersey certainly. Uh, you know, certainly. And, again, the the online gaming portion just soared during the pandemic, and it hasn't really fallen off at all during during you know now that the casinos are open. Again. No, I think you're seeing that in in Michigan. You're seeing it in New Jersey. Right. Kind of right. every market is uh, is validating that. Right. Right. No question. Now your retail shops in the UK, uh, you don't you don't have uh, you have those FOBT machines there, oh, yeah. And, and has, has that restriction impacted the, their operation at all? Yeah. So when so when the retail business was shut down, mm-hmm. um, all the betting shops, so right. pretty much everybody you couldn't go to a betting right. shop. Um, so it was it was pretty difficult, and then they eventually brought it back, but they brought it back with some restrictions. Right. How much time you could actually spend in the shop? Mm-hmm. You had to wear a mask, right. et cetera, et cetera. But now in the UK, it's it's pretty much um, you know you can go there as frequently as you want, mm-hmm. stay as long as you want, right. and the numbers have come back you know just kind of right where they okay. they left off, which is but nice. When when they reduced the the, the maximum bet uh, to two pounds, oh sure, uh, when that happened, right. yeah, that was a couple of years ago, right. and yeah, that was pretty dramatic, and right. and um, for certainly for us, it had a major impact sure. um, on our on our business and and the betting shops as well. So a number of the betting shops closed, but the interesting thing about it was as some of those closed, what we saw is a number of the customers kind of migrated to surrounding mm-hmm. areas. So in the in the long term, I think frankly for us and for our customers, it was kind of the long end of the tail got cut off. Right. Yeah. So they now kind of had the same level of business, somewhat like what you see in the casino business in North America mm-hmm. where people have shrunk their floors, but they're still sure. getting the same kind yeah, of yield. Absolutely, yeah. Same yeah. thing with the betting shops in the UK. So, you know, I always assumed that, you know, once uh, sports betting became really widespread, uh, you know, we could bet on the real games, I, I, I would assume the virtual sports would, would have fallen off, but that, that's not really the case, is it? No, they're, in fact, it's, it's the opposite. Yeah. Um, they're, they're complementary to one another. What happens is generally, um, you know, when a, in a mature sports betting market, Kind of virtuals ends up doing about ten to fifteen percent of what mm-hmm. the sports betting is. So right. when a you know person goes and watches a game that maybe the outcome isn't determined for three hours, 
in their intervening period, or if there's not live content on that they want, mm -hmm. they can play virtual sports. Right. So it's generally lower stake, um, mm -hmm. but it, and it's more of an activity where people will, you know, just kind of bet it more frequently because the outcome is right. almost, you know, every ninety seconds. Sure. Right. So, uh, so we found that it's actually very complementary to sports mm -hmm. betting, and and most of the operators want to have the ability to have that as a product alongside their sports betting. Okay. So explain how, how you how you make these games. Uh, you know, sure. uh, as you said, they're they're, they're short duration. Uh, um, you know, what, what goes into the, the construction of those games? So, depending on the game, but it can be very sophisticated mm -hmm. to the level of where we actually you know put people in the in the outfits with sensors right. and sure. actually film them mm -hmm. playing whatever the game is. Um, you know, whether it's basketball right. or football or or soccer. Um, and then we actually make that into, um, you know, motion capture, and right, then we sure. put that yeah. into an image and create essentially highlights. I mean, mm -hmm. it's basically the highlights of right. the game, but, yeah. you know, I joke, um, we did the basketball shoot recently, um, actually probably about a year ago, and we did it in Wales, mm -hmm. and I said, well, the funniest thing is, you know, try to find 10 guys in Wales that can dunk. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty sophisticated, yeah. you know, high-level graphics, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what attracts people to the games. Right, right. So, so, and you do all, all different sports. Yeah, so we're up to we're up to fifteen different sports. We're uh, we're just getting ready to probably in the first quarter next year uh, launch a baseball product. Okay, um, it'll be a home run derby, mm -hmm. um, and we think that'll be exciting not only for the North American market, but certainly Latin America and sure. Asia. And then this has become you know a worldwide business for yeah, us. Yeah, no question. How about horse racing? Do you any yeah, yeah, yeah. So horse racing is big. Mm -hmm. um, so in Pennsylvania and the lottery, we probably talked about this in you know one of the last couple of podcasts that we've done together. Um, so the Pennsylvania lottery is our is our biggest lottery customer, right. one of our biggest lottery customers, and so they have what they call Derby Cash. Mm -hmm. So it's a virtual horse race going off every three to four minutes in sports bars and right. convenience stores all around Pennsylvania, nine thousand locations. And people are, you know, engaging with it, yeah. which is what we want to see. And the mm -hmm. growth has been kind of north of 25% yeah. you know, on a pretty consistent basis. Great. Great. And we're just about ready to launch a new uh, football product mm -hmm. in, in Pennsylvania um, that will be a parlay. You know, because parlay sure, wagering right. is obviously very big here in the States. <coughs> so people will be able to watch a virtual football where there's eight games going on simultaneously and you're going to pick any one of the 16 teams that are playing one another and you can have you know a three-team parlay four team mm -hmm. up to 18 parlay so the betters can kind of determine what level of volatility that they want to go for sure so right. it's pretty uh pretty attractive and people are starting to understand more about, about parlays these days because of real sports betting yeah much. i mean i think one of the things that we probably took for granted in north america is because you know most of the markets where we have been whether it's italy greece mm -hmm. uk are mature sports betting markets and right. people are used to it and they've engaged in it for years and years and years yeah it's new to yeah. the states i mean it's you know a couple years Old and so what we found is most of the operators have been focused on sports, mm -hmm. um, but virtual sports comes along right behind it. And I know you see in the industry, there's certainly a lot more push now from those operators on iGaming as well, sure, because the margins are better for them. And right. it's a, so yeah, we think virtual sports is is kind of right on the cusp of being a major part of the gaming landscape for Great. the states. Great. Very interesting. Yeah. So you've announced some some new uh, contracts and partnerships lately. Give us some details on that. Well, so we've you know we we run the business and there's kind of four segments. So mm -hmm. our iGaming business, our virtual sports business, our gaming machine business, and then what we call the leisure business, which mm -hmm. is where we put gaming machines, but in pubs and right. motorway services mm -hmm. and holiday parks, et cetera, et cetera. So if you go across the kind of whole gamut of that, we've, you know, we're announcing deals on a fairly regular basis with all the major operators right. you would know, you know, BetMGM, FanDuel, mm -hmm. DraftKings. We just did a, um, a big VLT deal in Western Canada, um, growing in Illinois. When we first started talking a couple of years ago, we right. were just starting in Illinois. Mm -hmm. Now we're starting to get some real traction there. So, uh, yeah, pretty excited about our, our growth in North America. Okay. Konami's award-winning Synchros is the casino management system of choice for some of the industry's most innovative operators. Many have chosen Synchros in recent years. Operators like Rivers Casino in Pennsylvania and New York, Desert Diamond Casino in Arizona, Golden Entertainment, 10 casinos across the U.S., 
Carnival Corporation and Norwegian Cruise Lines, Las Vegas' newest strip mega resort, Resorts World Las Vegas, and it was selected by the nation's largest casino on the West Coast with over 6,500 slot machines and an amazing new resort hotel. To start speaking with the Konami team about Synchros and why so many casinos are choosing it, visit KonamiGaming.com slash connect. So, yeah, so tell us about Illinois. I mean, uh, you know, last time we talked, you had just gotten in there. Right. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, are these games uh, on the actual you know, machines in the pubs and restaurants and things like that? Yeah, so they're, they're truly VLTs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, one of the differentiating factors is when you go into a you know, restaurant or a cafe in Illinois, the most number of machines they can have is six. Mm -hmm. So generally what they do is they'll have mostly probably at least four or five different suppliers. They may have one right. or two machines or the other. But the real key is because these people are coming on a frequent basis is you've got to be able to change the content right. on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So all of our stuff is server-based and downloadable. Okay. So when we want to change games, we'll put in you know a game or two uh, every quarter just to keep the content fresh. Right. So it's less about the box itself in Illinois. Mm -hmm. It is really more about refreshing the content for local players that are going to play you know kind of three, four, five times a week. Right. But so so on this box, you you have all your games on one box then. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we'll have so the menu has ten games, um, and then kind of once every quarter we'll try and have a different game. We have, it's interesting. One of the things in the industry that people have always tried to figure out mm -hmm. is the level of volatility that players, right. um, you know, kind of migrate to. We ended up doing it. Basically, we show it on our machines as a thermometer. Right. So we have, you know, on the one mm -hmm. side it's more wins, and on the other side it's higher payouts. And then we put all of the various content that we have. So when a player walks up to our machine and is not sure about the games, right. they can literally look on this thermometer and say, "Well, this is the kind of, you know, I want to sit here for an hour or two, mm -hmm. or I want to play and I want to have a chance for a big payout." Right. So okay. um, yeah, so it's interesting that that's the way we're doing it in Illinois. So you're, and your partnerships with the online companies are, the, you know, they have all the games in there, and then they can just pick your games. It, exactly, uh -huh. and and the you know the iGaming business is a little bit like the real estate business right. is that you know it's really about the location. Location, right? Yeah. And from the operator's perspective, they're going to put the games on that are performing the best. So mm -hmm. it really is kind of. And certainly one of the, the things that probably we, from a competitive standpoint, since we don't have as big a retail presence in North America as, you know, like right, SI sure. Games or an IGT, right. um, but our games are resonating with the players. So for those that are not big North American retail slot mm -hmm. suppliers, our games are generally number one or number two. So, mm -hmm. you know, we've had a lot of experience in this in Europe, and it's, it's translated very well to the North American market. Now, on, I notice on, on a lot of online uh, slot games, there's a, a return to player function where you can actually see how much uh, the payback. Do, do, do you do, sure. guys do that? Too? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. So I think that's it's, you know, that's certainly what I've explained to a lot of people, and obviously your audience is very well educated in gaming. But you know, RTPs are going to be consistent along most of the suppliers. Right. But it's really how you generate that RTP. Right. Sure. The, right. You know the math behind it right. is what drives yeah. play. Yeah. Obviously, you know, you know, slot games are you know, the secret to the game is, is the math. You know, there's no doubt about it. And they it. can they can all be the same payback percentage or whatever. But you know, again, it's how you get there. Yeah, and and I think interestingly in online because it's again it's you're not putting it into big cabinets and everything mm -hmm. else. You can change games and you can take a math model that works well. And then what we call reskinning is basically change the graphics, change the art, but you know the math works, and then you get that out in the marketplace, and it's kind of a nice formula to get right. constant success in, right. in math models that work. So I'm wondering, like, what, what's the psychology of a player who plays the virtual sports? I mean, uh, you know, with a slot machine, you see the reels or, sure. or the lines sure. show up, but virtual sports, you know, you can the, the the result changes, and you can actually see kind of the players, you know. Reflect that. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it's it's interesting, and I I wish I could say that we would take credit for it, but virtual sports seems to um, work for all different kinds of players. Mm -hmm. So sports players like it because right. it's something that they recognize. It's fixed odds, mm -hmm. even though the outcome is determined randomly. But it's you know we have over unders and spreads right. and totals, and so sports betters like it. Lottery players like it because instead of like for example Keno, where it's basically you know spitting out ping right. pong balls. 
this is a visual virtual representation that's a lot more interesting but the outcome is very much derived like a like a kino game right and then casino players seem to gravitate to it as well because it is really an rng and the rtp is is not quite to the level of of iGaming, gaming, but mm -hmm. it's not far from it. So they like the engagement as well, and it's a you know it's not every two seconds like right. you do iGaming, gaming, sure. but it's you know so it's a good time for them to take a little respite and mm -hmm. and play virtual sports. So okay. yeah, again, I wish we could take credit for thinking that through, <laughs> but sometimes you get lucky. Yeah, right, exactly. So you mentioned the horse racing. I mean, is there any place in in these uh, horse racing uh, machine states where where you, you could uh, you know, yeah, I mean it's it's certainly one of the areas. Um, I think probably everyone in the industry is is sure. surprised at how big and resilient you mm -hmm. know historical horse racing has right. become. So we certainly have our, our eye on it. But our our real sweet spot is what we call distributed gaming. So right. locations where there's um, lots of locations but few numbers of machines, and people want to refresh the content. Sure, that's, sure. That's that's our sweet spot. So where where do you see? Uh, other jurisdictions opening with those distributed games. I mean, we, you know, we've already got you know Illinois is the, the big big one. But yeah. So Virginia had them, and now they're they're, they're they've banned them. So uh, yeah. Well, I think it's you know the the success in Illinois, I think, is going to be about Oregon. Obviously, has right. a lot of machines. Mm -hmm. um, Nevada, South Dakota, uh, yeah. South Dakota West Virginia. Right. Um, but I think from the operator's perspective, and when we deal with Illinois, we deal with a lot of the gaming operators. Right. Penn sure. Nationals yep. there, Delaware North is there. Um, and I think the model has worked, and it certainly has worked from the state side because it hasn't really negatively impacted the bigger land-based casinos. Um, but from a tax standpoint, they're generating more revenues from, mm -hmm. from gaming. So, you know, it's, I think Illinois is a, a nice proof model. And, you know, you certainly hear about this, whether it's, you know, Indiana, Missouri. There's always, you know, scuttlebutt out there, Pennsylvania. Sure. Right. Um, but, yeah, so we'll, we keep a close eye on it. Okay, great. So where do you see the future growth in the industry? I mean, uh, certainly you know, we're going to see more of these distributed gaming states, but you're going to see, and uh, I, I, I'm sure our online is at front, front of mind for you guys. Yeah, very much so. I mean, certainly, with, and whether it's online mm -hmm. gaming or online virtual sports, right. I mean, I would, I would suspect that if you looked at Inspired, you know, four or five years from now, we might be 50% of our business being digital and maybe you know, 60 to 70 percent of our EBITDA being mm. digital. Okay. So that's that's clearly the, the future for us. But retail, I mean, we have 35,000 machines yeah. out on a recurring revenue basis. So we have, you know, game designers and developers there who are motivated to make sure that the players engage with our product because we're in it just like the operator. We get a percentage of the cash box. Sure, sure. Well, I guess you've got to employ pretty much specialized designers in, in this field, though, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, these, uh, I think one of the things that I found interesting, you know, obviously my background, as you know, I've mm -hmm. been with Side Games for a long time. I was with Aristocrat for, for a number of years. Um, is one of the unique features that I find about Inspired with the game design folks is they really are players. I mean, they actually right. go into a market um, in Illinois, we spent a year in Illinois with our game designers looking at what was working, talking mm -hmm. to players, right. seeing what they liked, and we really developed bespoke product for that marketplace. Right. So on the online side, your your games are, are <coughs> uh, the casino games, right? I mean, they're not, they're not considered a sports book game. Yeah, no, they are they are casino games. Okay, that's sure. right. Well, it sounds like there's a, a bright future for your company, and uh, you know, you're growing pretty substantially. Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, you know, probably from the last time um, I spoke to you, our share price has kind of tripled. Mm -hmm. um, the business is, you know, certainly tracking along um, how we would expect it. Obviously, COVID has been something that's been difficult for everybody, but I think it was a good kind of time for everyone in the industry to take a real hard look at their business. So, yeah, we feel, we feel very confident about uh, the future and pretty excited about it. Great, great. Well, thanks for joining us, Brooks. It's great to see you again, and hopefully Likewise. we can do it next year and, uh, and uh, catch Maybe up. Maybe no mass next year. <laughs> that <laughs> no, would be for great. For sure, for sure. Okay. Thank you very thanks, much, Roger. and thanks for joining us on the GGB Podcast. Thanks again to our sponsor, Konami Gaming. Head to konamigaming.com slash connect to start speaking with Konami's top Synchros representatives about your 2022 technology goals. To learn more about simulated gaming, visit ggbmagazine.com. To get all the news of the gaming industry delivered to your desktop every Monday morning, sign up at ggbnews.com and use the coupon code GGB180 for a free subscription. Don't miss a single episode of the podcast. Sign up on Apple Podcasts or Spotify today. 
So we'll see you next time on the GGB Podcast.